Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar today. The topic for today's webinar is replacing New York City's dirty peaker power plants with renewables and battery storage. We have a number of excellent speakers lined up for today's webinar. Before I pass it over to them, I'd like to go over a few quick housekeeping notes. All of our attendees today are in listen-only mode. You have a couple of options to join the audio portion of today's webinar. You can call in using your computer mic and speakers, or you can use your telephone. If you'd like to minimize the webinar console so that you can view the presentation full screen, you can click on the orange arrow that you see circled there, and you can also use that to expand the webinar console. A very important note, we ask that you please submit your questions and your comments as you think of them by typing them into the question box on the webinar console and hitting send. We will save as much time as we can at the end of the webinar for a Q&A with the audience, um, but we do have a lot of people registered for this webinar. We expect to get a lot of questions. To make sure that we get to your question, type it in when you think of it. Don't wait until the end. And a final note, this webinar is being recorded. We will send you an email with a copy of the webinar recording and a PDF of the slides, probably this afternoon or tomorrow. And we'll also post all of those webinar materials on our website. Those will be at cleanegroup.org backslash webinars. That's also a good place to find information about upcoming webinars that we'll be hosting. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to our host for today's webinar, Seth Mollendor. Seth is a project director, I'm sorry, Seth is vice president and project director at Clean Energy Group, and he will be introducing our guest speakers and starting us off today. Seth, over to you. Thank you very much, Samantha, and thanks to everyone joining us. Um, it's going to be a really great talk today. As, as Sam mentioned, we have a lot of great speakers. Um, the, the report you see here, we're, we're going to be talking about in more detail today. Um, the, all the folks presenting on the call today are, are part of the coalition, which um, to find out more information about, you can go to coalition.org. And with that, Sam, if you'll go to the next slide, I'll introduce our lineup of speakers today. Um, so first, we're going to be hearing from a couple of folks from the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. Uh, Anel Hernandez, this is a director for uh, for Nija, and then Carlos Garcia is our energy planner um, that I'm going to be presenting uh, on, on that report. Then we're going to hear from Rachel Spector, who is the director for the Environmental Justice Program at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. Uh, then we're going to hear from Summer Sandoval, uh, at, she's the Energy Democracy Coordinator for Uprose. And then finally, Dariela Rodriguez, who is the director of community development for the Point CDC. Um, we also have on the line for the, the question and answer today our technical consultants for, for a lot of the work that we're doing for the uh, Peak Coalition. We have um, from Stratagen Consulting, we have uh, Aaron Childs, who's a manager there, and Elia Seed, who is a senior analyst. So with that, I'd like to um, pass things off to Anel to start the presentation today. Great, thank you so much, Seth. Just waiting for the slides, great. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I wanted to start off by talking a little bit about who the Peak Coalition is. Our coalition, as, as Seth just mentioned, consists of UPROSE, the Point CDC, the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, and Clean Energy Group. And we've all come together to end this long-standing issue of pollution burden from Peaker Plant in the city's most climate vulnerable communities and its environmental justice communities. Our collaboration brings together technical, legal, public health, and planning expertise to support organizing and advocacy led by the communities that are most harmed by Peaker Plant's emissions. We also have a lot of other uh, technical allies that are supporting this project. And together with communities, we are advocating for a system of localized renewable energy generation and battery storage to replace these peaker plants, reduce greenhouse gas emission, reduce co-pollutants, lower energy bills, and generally just make our electricity system cleaner and more resilient in the face of increased climate impacts. 
And all of this, of course, is in context of the landmark New York State Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act that we passed last year in 2019. And that bill has really set the stage for the transformation of New York State's energy grid. And some of the key elements of that bill is one, it reduces greenhouse gas emissions by 85% by 2050. Um, it also prioritizes marginalized communities and dedicates 35% of clean energy and energy efficiency spending to disadvantaged communities. It also sets specific uh, renewable energy targets for New York State, including an interim target of 70% of electricity by 2030 and a completely carbon free electricity sector by 2040. So we have some really major goals that we're working toward. And you know, we were able to accomplish this with a very big coalition called New York Renews that many of us are part of um, in this call. And so I just wanted to share that because it really sets the stage for our peak campaign and to get us to the targets that we set out in the CLCPA. So I also wanted to talk a little bit about my organization, NIJA, and who we are. Um, we are a citywide membership network of grassroots organizations from low income communities and communities of color across New York City. Um, we have 11 members representing a variety of communities in Brooklyn, in Queens, and Manhattan and the Bronx. And we come together around a variety of environmental issues. And more recently, one of our biggest focus has been tackling the energy sector. And you know, we have been fighting peaker plants for a very long time. I think almost 20 years ago now, um, we sued um, the New York Power Authority for the siting of all these new peaker plants in our communities. And so this is a really important issue for us and something that we've been working on for, for decades now. And so even though peaker plants do not run very often, their limited operation contributes significantly, significantly to local air pollution um, compared to uh, baseload power plants. Um, these fossil fuel peaker plants emit localized pollutants such as NOx and SOx, um, which are directly harmful to public health in these communities and contribute to the secondary formation of ozone and PM 2.5. And just to give you an idea of, of how bad these public health issues are, in the South Bronx, childhood asthma rates are double the New York City average. So this for us is, is a huge issue. Um, it's also important to note that a lot of these speaker plants are sited in areas where there are various other noxious and industrial polluting infrastructure. And so it really adds to the cumulative burdens that these communities are experiencing. And in addition to air pollution impacts, one of the things that we've been looking into is extreme heat and how that will impact New York City in the future. Um, a lot of studies have shown that increase in temperature is gonna cause increase in morbidity and mortality due to extreme heat exposure. Um, in New York City, extreme heat and the urban heat island effect continues to exacerbate health and energy inequities. Um, particularly in the communities that are also dealing with um, poor air quality issues. Um, the New York Panel on Climate Change projects that by 2050, New York City is expected to see the number of 90 degree days double um, and heat waves triple or even quadruple. So this is a really big issue um, impacting New York City. And today, um, we are seeing this issue compounded even further by the COVID-19 crisis um, and a lot of the communities that are already suffering from higher rates of asthma and respiratory issues are now dealing with this um, additional risk related to extreme heat. And all of this, of course, is also going to have an impact on our energy grid as more and more people use um, air conditioners and, and stay inside to keep cool. And just to give you a quick snapshot of what we are talking about when we say peaker plants, and um, my colleague Carlos will go a little bit deeper into you know, what a peaker plant is. Um, but here's a quick snapshot of one of the plants in the South Bronx, it's called Hellgate, a pretty accurate name, I would say. 
Um, so this plant is owned by the New York Power Authority. It came online in 2001, has a capacity of, of 94 megawatts and an annual average emissions of about 25,000 tons of CO2. And as the report showed, they received uh, close to $80 million over the last um, 10 years for capacity payments um, just to be there available to run. And you can see from the photographs that, of course, the Peaker plant is located in an area where there are a lot of other industrial uses and noxious and polluting infrastructure. And you can see from the picture that there's actually yet another Peaker plant sited very closely to it, and that's Hardham River Yard. So that's why it's important for us to, to think about the emissions of Peaker plants in the context of cumulative emissions in a particular community. And with that, I will pass it over to Carlos. Thanks, Adele. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carlos Garcia. I'm the energy planner for the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. And I'm going to dive right in since I'll be talking about more technical issues and could talk about any one of them for hours. So today I'm going to give a brief overview of what a peaker is, why peaker plants were necessary for grid reliability, the role of renewables and energy storage assets in replacing peakers and large scale fossil fuel generators. And finally, some of the peak coalition's efforts in understanding and helping to re envision New York City's energy system. First, I want to give a brief overview of what a peaker is. A peaker power plant, also known as a peaker plant or a peaker, is a smaller power plant that provides a relatively small amount of energy compared to your average size power plant. New York City's fleet of peakers are very old, with the oldest operating peaker built in 1954 and currently running in Astoria, Queens. New York City's peakers are mainly comprised of combustion turbines, also known as GTs, that run on natural gas with fuel oil as their secondary fuel source. Combustion turbines, which operate much like a jet engine, are considered one of the most, if not the most, inefficient types of power plants with few of these simple cycle combustion turbines reaching efficiencies above 30%. Because of their age and an inherently low fuel efficiency, peakers have a very high marginal cost of generation as compared to base load power plants, which is why peaker plant owners rely heavily on capacity market revenues and only run when electricity demand and the market's clearing price uh, are at their highest. One final commonality with peakers is that they are dirty. Peaker emission rates of carbon dioxide and health harming criteria air pollutants are incredibly high. And as we are unfortunately seeing, New York City's frontline communities already impacted disproportionately by peaker air pollution are also emerging as among the hardest hit by COVID-19. New research links the long-term exposure to air pollution to the significantly higher rates of deaths in people infected with COVID-19. Now that we all have a basic understanding of the common characteristics of peakers, we can discuss their primary purpose and why they were and will continue to be necessary unless we replace them with renewables and energy storage. As the name suggests, peakers generally only supply energy when there is a high demand, known as peak demand for electricity. As shown in the simplified load and generation dispatch graph, Peakers normally only run on days where peak demand is too high for cheaper and more efficient base load and intermediate generation to meet. As I'll discuss in a few moments, the market signal for peakers to run usually occurs when demand is at its highest or when some transmission disruption occurs that prohibits energy from servicing the load pocket peakers are located. To give a real world example of the last graph, and to illustrate the challenge of maintaining grid stability, I've constructed the energy load demand of last year's peak demand day using NISO energy data. A year's peak demand day refers to the day in a year in which the grid operator, in New York's case, the New York Independent System Operator, also known as NISO, observed its highest demand for energy. Last year, this occurred on a Saturday in mid-July around 4 p.m. And as you can see, energy demand was reported in five minute intervals but can change dramatically minute to minute. Taking a more granular look at last year's peak demand day highlights the immense challenge grid operators and utilities have in ensuring that the production and distribution of electricity are at the right levels to meet real-time demand. When the power grid does not have enough energy to meet demand, brownout occurs. 
when large equipment fails at power generating stations, uh, damage to substations and transmission lines, or a substantial overload of the system, a blackout occurs. New York's power generation and transmission capacity must be sufficient to meet peak demand for electricity, yet must also have adequate flexibility to address variability and uncertainty in demand like we see here. The grid must maintain steady frequency and voltage within an acceptable range, which is why New York turned to peakers. New for their time, peakers were able to provide relatively cheap energy at very fast ramp rates. As more people demanded energy from the grid, characteristics unique to peakers allowed them to provide various ancillary services, which refers to functions that help grid operators maintain a, a stable electricity system. From Black Star regulation to frequency response, peakers provided a necessary and technically unique set of services for the grid. Before the negative externalities from fossil fuel electricity production were fully understood, peakers were one of the only local uh, logical generation sources that could provide these vital services to the grid. Fast forward almost half a century, and a mounting concern over carbon-based energy production is pushing government entities and private companies to diversify energy resources and bring renewable energy generation to the forefront of policy discussion. Capital costs associated with renewable energy generation and energy storage have fallen dramatically in the past few years, with ex costs expected to fall even further in the future. Due to the advancement in technology research and development, it is now economically and technically viable to replace peakers with energy storage assets on a grid filled with renewable energy. However, there are many different ways to store energy, and different energy storage systems fit best with different application uses, mostly due to an energy storage technology's characteristics. I've made this chart to show the different types of energy storage systems and the category of grid services it can provide based on their electrical characteristics. The x-axis represents an energy storage system's power rating, denoted in megawatts, which you can think of as how much energy can flow out of a storage system at any given instant. On the y-axis, you have the discharge time, which you can think of uh, as how long it takes for the energy system to discharge energy at. On the top, we have our three main different applications. First, we have response and reserve services, which respond to quick fluctuations in the energy grid and require quick response time. Second, we have transmission and distribution grid services, which help support the transmission grid, relieve congestion, uh, meet peak demand, allow deferral of expensive transmission system upgrades, and provides on-site power for substations across the system. Last, we have bulk power management, which is for energy ramp control and short-term balancing and reserves. Energy storage systems are, are, are also generally, generally categorized as either mechanical, electromechanical, or electrical. Uh, and of course, as technology R&D expands, so will their application use. Lastly, I am incredibly proud to share with everyone the efforts members of the Peak Coalition have made to understand and shape New York's energy system. As a voting stakeholder at NISO, the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance is the first environmental justice organization to be a part of NISO's stakeholder process. In working to understand the different energy market structures and grid systems, we are now able to better comprehend and help shape proposals, such as uh, the DER participation model, hybrid storage interconnection proposal, uh, and energy storage participation model to be more equitable and just in New York City's frontline community. Peak Coalition members frequently file comments as party stakeholders with the New York Public Service Commission on a variety of different issues, many of which relate to New York's peakers and the development of renewables and energy storage. An example being the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance comments uh, on the PS PSD's motions to consider dramatically altering New York's capacity market, which Seth will discuss in greater detail next. And finally, PEAK is working with a variety of government authorities to help advance the development of distributed energy generation while increasing end-user energy efficiency measures and demand response in environmental justice communities, a great example of that being with NYSERDA. Renewables and energy storage are a compelling alternative to PEAKers and as demand-side alternatives to managing peak demand. There has never been a better time to replace these inefficient and uneconomic polluting energy generation sources and Peak is doing everything in its power to expedite this inevitability. 
thank you all for your time and attention. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have at the end of our presentation. And next we have Seth to discuss peaker and capacity payment findings from the Peak Coalition Report. Thank you so much, Carlos. Um, that was a great overview of everything. Uh, so a quick introduction to, to Clean Energy Group. We are a, a national nonprofit for uh, the last two decades. We've been uh, working on advocacy efforts uh, around innovative policy, technology, and finance strategies uh, in areas of clean energy and, and climate change. Uh, listed here are a few of our, our major initiatives. One is a resilient power project to get solar and storage to, to more disadvantaged communities. So we have to look at the intersection of energy storage and health, uh, energy storage policy. Of course, our, our peaker work that we're talking about today. Uh, also finance, and, and then we have a sister organization called Clean Energy State Alliance. That's a, a member support organization of uh, mostly state agencies that manage clean energy funds uh, at the state level. So uh, as Carla said, I'm going to get into uh, capacity markets. And I'm going to talk about some of the findings from the report that the Peak Coalition recently put out called Dirty Energy, Big Money. I'm going to be talking about the big money portion of that um, because beyond the uh, environmental and public health impacts that peakers have on the communities that they are in, uh, and surrounding communities, there's also major economic economic impacts uh, from the continued use of peaker plants that are are quite expensive to um, to keep online. So a little background on uh, capacity markets. So they were developed as a way uh, to compensate energy providers, so power plants and, and other folks that generate energy uh, for the power that they can deliver to the energy system at any time. It's it's meant to make sure that utilities or load serving entities uh, have enough generation capacity available to meet expected levels of uh, current and future demand. Uh, it also incorporates a reserve margin um, that, that allows for some flexibility there. So if forecasts are a little bit off, there's, there's extra capacity there to meet that extra reserve. The um, compensation levels that are set or capacity payments that are, are paid through through these capacity markets are, are determined by periodic auctions where those providing capacity energy providers, these are power plant uh, owners, they um, they bid their price in and the clearing price that is set um, is, is the level of compensation that everyone gets, um, whether their bid is lower than that or not. Uh, so a lot of the capacity is set through this, this market um, mechanism, but it can also be set through directly through bilateral contracts between load serving entities, so utilities, and energy providers. So a utility like uh, Con Edison in, in New York City might directly have a contract with one of the power plant um, owners to provide that capacity. Uh, and capacity prices are typically higher, uh, often much, much higher in. Uh, energy constrained areas or power constrained areas where, where there's not enough um, transmission capacity to get energy uh, from other areas. So say uh, getting energy from uh, projects in upstate New York down into to the city. So New York City has some of the highest capacity payments levels in, in the country. So as I said, the reason we did this was we wanted to peel back um, some of the, the curtains behind what these power plants are actually costing because um, there's just not a lot of easy to understand publicly available data on this. So we enlisted our technical consultants, um, strategy and consulting, as I said, are, are online today to answer any technical questions specific to this, um, to look at what the, the estimates were or how much these power plants were getting paid uh, over the last decade, so from 2010 to 2019. What you see here is a table that lists all of the uh, power plants that uh, qualified as peakers for the analysis. That's, that's any power plant that was operated at a capacity factor. Uh, capacity factor is basically the, the amount of energy produced by a power plant over a year versus the amount of energy it could have produced. So 15% basically means the power plant ran 15% of the time. So anything that ran 15% of the time or less was um, identified as a peaker plant. There were 15 plants that qualified for that. There, there are uh, a couple other plants that, that were a bit higher than that, or they're also considered a peaker, but it weren't included here. Um, 
And it's important to note that a lot of these power plants operate a lot less than 15%. On, on average, these power plants ran only about 6% of the time. That's less than 500 hours throughout an entire year. And a number of the plants were even less than 1% of the time. That, that's less than, than 100 hours a year, even less than 90 hours a year. So not a lot. Um, but we're talking about big numbers. So I'll get into this a little bit more. The other thing to note is that the, the, these 15 power plants, they have uh, five owners. There's three private companies, and then, um, then there's the utility consolidated Edison and the New York Power Authority that, that owns several of these. So the big important number here, the big takeaway from the report, is that over the past decade, these peaker plants, even though they don't run a lot, um, they have brought in over four and a half billion dollars uh, in revenue. And that's passive revenue only. This is just what they get paid to basically sit there and, and be ready to operate. Uh, they may make additional revenue through the capital energy that they produce or providing other good services. So that, that's $4.5 million to 15 plants to basically sit there and, and, and be ready. Another important takeaway is that the private companies um, that own peaker plants took away the more majority of that payment. And these are all out-of-state companies, all out of New York. Um, together, those, those three companies, uh, this is uh, Art Flight Capital, that is uh, Boston-based hedge funds, uh, Energy Energy, which is a Houston-based fossil fuel company, and LS Power, which is based in uh, New Jersey's private equity firm there, $4 billion for their power plants. And, and these are, uh, in general, these are some of the biggest, oldest, and, and dirtiest plants in New York City. Uh, another takeaway from this is that you know, power plants that didn't operate that much still got a lot of money. Uh, almost uh, 100 million was paid to, to power plants in, in 2018 that had uh, very low capacity factors. Um, they operated less than 1% of the time throughout that year, uh, so not much at all. Uh, just to pull out one example, the uh, Kiwanis Power Plant that you'll be hearing about a little bit later that's owned by Arclight Capital. Uh, they had a capacity factor of 0.3%. That means they ran the equivalent of about 30 hours in, in 2018. Uh, and for that 30 hours of operation, they earned uh, $46 million of them. Um, that, that if you were translating to that actual cost per kilowatt hour, that's basically $2.50 per kilowatt hour which is around 1,300 times the average cost of energy in, in New York City. So you know, the numbers aren't, aren't as important as just the takeaway that this is really, really expensive energy. And these are costs that are directly passed on to uh, utility customers, packed on, it's passed on to um, residents of New York City and, and New York City businesses. As I said earlier, New York City has some of the highest, if not the highest cost per capacity in the country. Um, and they represent a lot of the cost of the power system. They, they don't operate, they don't produce many of the kilowatt hours that are consumed by folks, but they represent up to 5% of a customer's electricity bill. For the average uh, resident of New York City, that means that they've spent over $500 over the past 10 years to support these dirty fossil fuel power plants in, in their backyards. Uh, one uh, last point I wanted to talk about before passing it along is, is that this is not just a New York City problem. This is a national problem. This map, uh, which is based on um, information from the Energy Information Administration, uh, shows the peaker plants that are, are operational in the United States. There are about 1,200 of them. Um, and as you can see, they tend to be clustered around population centers. So a lot of the places where most people live, that's where you're going to find most of the peaker power plants. Uh, in general, they're, they're located in and around urban communities, um, often in disadvantaged communities, um, both low-income communities and, and communities of color. Uh, looking at a few of the metropolitan regions where, where these are most prevalent, um, these are the, the top 10 metropolitan regions that are, are burdened by an aging fleet of fossil fuel peaker plants. 
Um, these top 10 represent nearly 200 operational peaker plants and around 48 gigawatts of generating capacity, which is a lot of generation capacity uh, around really dense population centers. Now, on the average, these power plants uh, had a capacity factor of less than 4%. That's less than 300 hours per year. So they don't operate a lot, um, but they are generally responsible for a big chunk of the cost of the operating system and a significant source of urban air emissions. Um, they're ripe for replacement. Uh, battery storage can provide a lot of the same things that, that uh, speakers can, and when coupled with renewables, you don't have any emissions. So that's a lot of what the Peak Coalition is, is aiming to do. Um, and with that, I'm, I'm going to hand it off to, to Rachel to talk more about some of the, the policy and intervention points for, for the speaker replacement. Thanks, Seth. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Rachel Spector. I direct the Environmental Justice Program at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. Um, we call ourselves NILPI. That's our acronym. And so we've been around for about 40 years. We're a small uh, civil rights nonprofit legal organization where we have uh, lawyers as well as advocates and organizers. Um, and our Environmental Justice Program has been around for a while sort of since the really since the start of the environmental justice movement in New York City um, and for that time for for over 20 years almost 30 we've been working to eliminate the unfair burden of environmental hazards um, in low-income communities and communities of color around the city um, and have been working with many of the groups who are part of the peak coalition for almost that amount of time and so today, I'm just going to speak briefly about some of the new laws and regulations, as well as some longstanding laws um, that are really uh, shaping the landscape for peaker plant operations and advocacy um, by our coalition and others to transition off of peaker plants. And so, as Anel mentioned early on, the um, biggest, sort of most monumental um, new set of tools that we have is the New York Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, the CLCPA, which was passed last year. And so for those of you who are listening in from uh, other parts of the country, um, unfortunately, this may not apply for, for you in your local advocacy, but could potentially provide some, some ideas. Um, uh, so, so in very large, um, biggest terms, what the CLCPA does is require a transition to a zero emissions electricity sector by 2040, which is obviously sets the clock ticking um, for transition off of fossil fuel peaker plants. But it also contains several other provisions that we think are really important um, and can be leveraged uh, in this work. Um, and one of them is a focus throughout the statute on not just reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but also maximizing reduction of co-pollutants um, in what the law calls disadvantaged communities. And while the um, state has not yet defined exactly which communities are labeled disadvantaged communities. It sets out criteria um, for determining and for determining a disadvantaged communities that takes into account um, cumulative environmental burdens, uh, low income areas and other um, factors of socioeconomic disadvantage, as well as uh, vulnerability to climate change. So throughout the law, there's a focus on prioritizing and maximizing reductions of co-pollutants in disadvantaged communities. So facilities like power, like peaker power plants that are located um, in communities like the South Bronx and Sunset Park that we're, we're speaking about here should be first on the list um, for reductions. Second, also as Anil mentioned, it mandates investment in 
disadvantaged communities for clean energy and energy efficiency. It also contains a provision uh, specifically stating that as the state moves forward to plan the programs that you know will point the way more specifically to how the state is going to reach the greenhouse gas emission reduction targets and the expansion of clean energy, um, that it must actually prioritize the use of energy storage projects that will displace peaker plants in disadvantaged communities. And that specific provision um, is part of an amendment to the public service law. So what will happen in the next couple of years is New York's Public Service Commission um, is required to initiate a proceeding and develop a program that will implement the mandated three gigawatts of energy storage throughout the state. And again, the commission is directed to design that program so that these energy storage projects will decrease the use of peaker plants in disadvantaged communities. And a number of these key provisions are incorporated into the New York State Energy Plan. Um, finally, there's another key provision of the CLCPA, um, which is section seven of the law. And there are two, two sort of uh, parallel provisions. The first is that whenever a state entity is issuing a permit or a license or an approval or entering into a contract, it must ensure that that underlying project is consistent with the greenhouse gas um, limits in the CLCPA. And if it's not, in order to approve the, the permit, the state entity must issue a detailed statement justifying why it is approving this project, even if it's not consistent with the law, um, and must also identify alternatives or mitigation. Similarly, state entities, when issuing permits or licenses or approving contracts, shall not disproportionately burden disadvantaged communities. And again, um, there's a goal of prioritizing the co-pollutant reductions in disadvantaged communities. Um, so these twin provisions are very broad. Um, they apply to the all state entities. Um, and we think that they could be a game changer for um, permits of all types of uh, fossil fuel infrastructure. We have seen in the past couple of weeks, the State Department of Environmental Conservation denied a water quality permit for a new pipeline, for a new natural gas pipeline, citing this provision of the CLCPA. And so there are a number of routine um, air quality permits that all peaker plants in New York City are required to have that are coming up for renewal within the next year. Um, and this provision of the CLCPA provides a new tool to raise issues, um, both around continued greenhouse gas emissions, reliance on fossil fuel infrastructure for electricity generation, and for disproportionate, disproportionate burdens that these plants cause in um, communities of color and low-income communities in the city. So another, separately, another um, important provision is that at the end of last year, the New York Department of Environmental Conservation issued new limits, issued new regulations that will limit NOx emissions from peaker plants during the ozone season. Um, they start to go into an effect in 2023, and by 2025, the limits that you see here will be in effect. Um, almost all of I would say almost all of the privately owned peaker plants in New York City currently exceed, some far exceed these limits. Um, the plants owned by the New York Power Authority, which are 
newer, relatively newer, um, are already um, in compliance, so they will not have to change their operations to, to comply with the new regulations, but all the other plants will. Um, they recently had to submit their compliance plans. Um, from what we have seen, um, the Ravenswood plant plans to shut down all 17 of its turbines. Um, several of the Con Ed plants will be retired. Um, two plants owned by Astoria Generating Company in Brooklyn, the Gowanus and Narrows, plan to be retired, and that company um, is seeking to install new infrastructure at one of the sites, essentially um, seeking a repowering. So that's what we've seen thus far. Uh, so we know that in the coming years, these regulations are going to have a real impact on what the peaker plant landscape looks like in the city. Um, so finally, as I mentioned, there are uh, these two power plants in Brooklyn, that, that peaker plants that are planned to be retired before the NOx regulations kick in, but the company is seeking to um, repower those plants, so bring in new infrastructure to replace those two plants at one existing site. Um, and to do this, it has to go through a siting proceeding, proceeding under New York's uh, Article 10 of the public service law. And many states have similar laws. Um, this law requires a siting board to evaluate um, all new electric generating infrastructure um, to determine whether it um, is necessary and is sort of uh, environmentally compatible, which is a funny term. Um, but uh, as you can see here, there are criteria that the board needs to examine. Um, and in addition to these basic criteria, there's also now uh, consistency with the CLCPA, um, which has been um, in large part incorporated into the state energy plan. And in addition, um, the proceeding that is anticipated in Brooklyn um, will be the first to undergo to include a detailed environmental justice analysis. Um, Article 10 was amended um, a little less than 10 years ago to require um, an in-depth environmental justice analysis if a plant was proposed to be cited within an area that's designated by the state DEC as a potential environmental justice area. Um, so that proceeding we anticipate will be coming up. The company has filed um, pre-application materials but has not yet filed its application. And um, I will turn it over to Summer from Uprose to talk a little bit more about what it looks like on the ground in Sunset Park. Awesome. Thank you, Rachel. Um, and thank you for that great policy overview. Um, next, I will be talking about Uprose and our work on the ground about local implementation of a lot of the policies that Rachel outlined. Um, but first, hi everyone again. My name is Summer Sandoval and I am the Energy Democracy Coordinator at Uprose. Uprose was founded in 1966 and is Brooklyn's oldest Latino community-based organization. Today, Uprose is an intergenerational, multiracial, and nationally recognized community organization that promotes sustainability and resiliency in the Sunset Park community in Brooklyn through community organizing, education, leadership development, and cultural artistic expression. Um, first, to give you all a little bit of context um, about Sunset Park. So Sunset Park is a neighborhood located in the southwest of Brooklyn with a population of roughly 130,000 people. Sunset Park is a very diverse community um, with 55% of the community is Latino and 25% is Asian, specifically um, Chinese from the Fujian province. Um, Sunset Park is also an industrial waterfront community and is home to New York City's largest significant maritime industrial area um, with 14 million square feet of industrially zoned land. 50% of the community is linguistically isolated and 31% of 
live below um, the poverty line. Sunset Park is also an environmental justice community. There are many polluting infrastructure cited in the community, um, such as the Guanas Expressway that transverses the neighborhood and sees roughly 200,000 cars and 25,000 diesel trucks on a daily basis. Um, there's also two solid waste transfer stations. And in regards to our energy system, there are um, three peaker power plants. And all, of the, and all of these pollution sources contribute to a history and long-term exposure to very high levels of pollution, which in turn has led to disproportionate impacts from the global COVID-19 pandemic. As mentioned before, COVID-19 has had a devastating impact on environmental justice communities such as Sunset Park. As mentioned before, studies show how the long-term exposure to pollution, particularly PM 2.5, which is smart, very small particulate matter, has led to significantly higher rates of death among people with COVID. There are also inequities in the accessibility to resources and aid, such as language and translation, immigration status, technology, such as access to computers, data, and Wi-Fi, and then personal capacity in terms of people have lost jobs or are essential workers and have to go to work and put their families at risk. Other issues um, include healthcare, access to healthcare services um, and coverage, as well as housing security and situation, um, as many people are living in very small um, cramped apartments with very large families. In conclusion, COVID-19 is an environmental justice issue directly tied to the inequities of our energy system. So now I'll introduce some of UpRose's works work and campaigns. I'm gonna start with introducing um, the Green Resilient Industrial District or GRID, um, which is a community led proposal in Sunset Park. The GRID is a comprehensive and holistic proposal that Uppers created with the support of the collective for community, culture and environment. The GRID looks at community, land use, zoning and policy and how all of these different aspects synergize and how to utilize the industrial sector as the economic engine to build for climate mitigation and resilience. The grid outlines how local solutions can help meet regional climate needs and serve as a model to operationalize policies such as New York's Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act in, a, in local implementation to meet the policies um, to meet both the policies and mission and equity mandates and to create industrial sector climate jobs, such as in the construction and renewable energy and retrofit sectors. The next campaign is the Guanas Repowering, which Rachel um, has touched upon a little bit. Um, so as well as creating and building local solutions, we also work and have to fight the systemic business as usual investments in fossil fuels. Um, as mentioned before, the Storia Generating Company is the private owner of two peaker power plants in Sunset Park, which are nearing the end of their lifetimes. And the, um, the company has submitted a proposal to replace them with new gas fired peaker plants. And UpRose is engaged in this process through the article um, through Article 10 that Rachel spoke about earlier, um, that designates funding for community participation. And we are working um, with NILPI and Earth Justice, um, as well as other technical systems providers on this effort to advocate for renewable energy alternatives such as solar and storage. We see this as a local challenge. Um, for the equitable implementation of the CLCPA compliance. And um, I also wanna briefly mention or um, talk about our renewable energy work. So Sunset Park, and which is in Sunset Park Solar. So Sunset Park Solar is one of many renewable energy initiatives that we are engaged on. 
Sunset Park Solar is New York's first cooperatively owned community solar project. And um, it's a very innovative team. You see all the locals on the bottom there, but it's the first time that a community-based organization is leading this type of renewable energy development project. We are building um, a 685 kilowatt system on the Brooklyn Army Terminal Building, which is located in Sunset Park. And the project will support 150 to 200 local households and small businesses and help subscribers um, to the project save 15% on their monthly energy bills. The project will also offer local workforce development opportunity and train um, local community members to attend a free solar installation training to be hired by our solar installer to work on the construction. And this is just a glimpse of a lot of the work um, that we are doing on the ground that really highlights the importance of frontline leadership in the transition into renewable energy economy that is rooted in both equity and justice and looking at um, you know, creating pilots um, for showing what local implementation of a lot of these citywide and statewide policies can look like on the ground. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to um, Dariella to talk about the great work that the Point is doing in the South Bronx. Hello, everybody. Sorry about that. I'm Dariela Rodriguez. I am the community um, person at the Point CDC. My title is Director of Community Development there. First, I want to say thank you for everyone that has joined us and thank you for the amazing presentations from um, all our partners. Uh, a little bit about the Point CDC. We are actually two blocks away from the Six Train, the Hunts Point train station. And although we have a very big Bronx, the South Bronx and Hunts Point specifically is a very unique um, community known for being one of the hardest hit when the Bronx was burning and um, therefore having a legacy of community led solutions. Uh, we have 25 years of art, youth programming and community organizing that has a lot to do with environmental justice and the burdens that um, we deal with every day in our community. Uh, much like up rolls and like summer's um, presentation, we are in a community that's suffering from high, some of the highest rates of child, um, childhood asthma and hospitalization rates due to asthma. Uh, there's um, infrastructure in our community that, that creates um, burdens, environmental justice burdens like air quality issues and water quality issues. Um, we also are on an industrial waterfront housing uh, one of the country's uh, largest food distribution centers famous for being um, one of the largest cooperatives but uh, we see that infrastructure in our in our community creates air quality water quality issues that are oppressive and life-threatening and that people make decisions about infrastructure um, much like uh, the industrial waterfront in Brooklyn that Summer spoke about, if you see, we have not only the Bruckner Expressway, but the Bruckner is one of four highways that put us in what's been nicknamed as Asthma Alley or the Toxic Triangle. Uh, we have 15 waste transfer, waste transfer stations and a wastewater treatment facility and two peaker power plants. Um, as part of the U.S. HUD Rebuild by Design uh, process, the Point CDC, along with um, government agencies and community stakeholders, engaged in a five-year process that led to money being um, allocated for energy and storage and more. Um, some of these projects included um, solar and storage on two emergency evacuation sites, which were two public schools as well as um, addressing other ways of being more resilient um, during you know climate emergencies um, we we see here some of the the details of how um, the market and the schools 
uh, are located and we can see how and why the Hunts Point community is like a little bit separated from how the rest of the, the Bronx is. Um, we have had to deal with not only environmental justice issues, but also, um, pro, pro, you know, protecting ourselves from climate disasters, um, such as we saw during Sandy. Uh, so we like um, uprose and we're learning all the time from our community partners, uh, feel that two public schools and having solar and storage on two public schools is not enough. And we have a continued commitment to the community, um, to community ownership of solar. We um, see this and our community ownership of solar projects to address energy needs as a vital uh, piece of how community-led solutions really change our communities and bring um, the justice that we need. So please stay tuned and um, you'll learn more about what we have coming up. Um, and then one of the other ways in which we're looking at our waterfront and other opportunities for um, just transition is the Renewable Rikers campaign. Um, we, we know that what, what um, Rikers Island means to the Bronx has a lot to do with a legacy of incarceration, trauma, abuse. And, um, and that's the current legacy. We see that this makes it an important piece of a puzzle for our city and our community um, to change that legacy, to, to use this as a hub for just transition. Um, and we're advocating for Renewable Rikers Act to study the feasibility of large scale solar and storage. And of course, this is part of a larger, much larger collect collective vision having to do with impact and um, community vision and, and solutions. Um, again, as uh, we've seen in the other slides, the burdens of heat and the burdens of air quality issues are compounded in our community. And if we were to put a, a map on top of this that showed where essential workers are and where people are getting on and off the train the most during this uh, COVID time, we will see that some of these areas are, again, the most burdened. Um, and there's layers and layers of these burdens. We um, we cannot afford to have any polluters or any bad players in our neighborhood. We know that this uh, the peaker plants are an example of exactly this, and um, we want to honor solutions because we know that our communities are the solutions and continue to be the people that can lead us towards um, towards the solutions. So we see this peak, peak campaign and all the information that we're finding out. Um, that supports exactly what we know, that air quality issues burden our community in a way that um, not only oppress us, but are, um, threaten our lives, and that we must continue to do this kind of work um, and be creative and have community-led solutions in order to get to where we need to be, not just in smaller communities, but like as a city and as a country. Um, so thank you, that's my presentation, and I'm sending it over to Seth, who's gonna lead us in a QA. and a Thank you, Dariella, and thanks everybody. Um, so a lot of information. We've got to start the question and answer portion of the webinar. We've got a lot of great questions come in already. Um, I'm not sure we're going to be able to get to all of them. I'm going to say to the folks that we don't get to your question, I'm going to be jumping around a little bit. Um, to the most um, but if you don't get your question answered on this, you can reach out to all the groups that are part of the Peak Coalition at peakcoalition.org. Uh, there is an email uh, address there that you can, can fill out a form and reach us all, or you can respond, respond directly to the, um, the webinar announcements or the webinar materials that you get, and that will, will reach back to the groups too if you don't have our direct contact information. So I'm going to start off uh, with a question that I think we have a lot of followers. Uh, okay. yeah, in the facts that uh, speakers are pretty inefficient, inefficient uh, who is it that is arguing to keep them running? And uh, I have some thoughts on this, but I'm going to hand it over to Carlos, I think, to, to take the first stab at this. Hey, Seth, I'm, I'm sorry, I had trouble hearing you. I don't know if that was geared towards me or, or what the question was. Oh, sorry, Carlos. Um, the question was, given the fact that uh, peakers are, are old, dirty, and in inefficient, who is it that is arguing to keep them running. Yeah, great. I'm, I'm happy to take a side with that. 
So the, the you know, picker plants have been operating, you know, as we've seen for decades. So, you know, and, and there's obviously it's, it's very lucrative business platform to to operate and to receive with um, the current market structures of capacity payments and market clearing prices and lo locational based market pricing as well. So um, apart from peaker plan owners and private equity firms that receive a pretty um, healthy return on uh, an investment with negative so social externalities and uh, negative social costs, um, utilities tend to be pretty um, tough to deal with um, when it comes to advocating for and really finding possible solutions um, to replace these peaker plants. And the usual um, uh, description or spiel that a lot of advocates will um, give towards keeping peaker plants in place is that for reliability reasons and for energy grid reasons and constraints and um, sustainability of the energy and load pocket infrastructure and to keep the lights on, these peaker plants are extremely vital and no other technology can replace it because of the characteristics and the ramp rates and um, the just technical characteristics that these peaker plants can um, provide. Uh, as, you know, as we've seen, and, and I hope that my presentation helped expel a little bit, um, now with the advent and, and research and development of technology and energy storage and renewables, that's, that's not the case whatsoever. And as we've seen in um, numerous um, cities and, and locations around the United States, many in um, California, uh, renewables and energy storage are more than capable and easily um, developed to be able to provide the same grid services and reliability um, that peakers have without any uh, great changes to um, low duration and reliability and um, resource adequacy uh, of the grid and the load pocket. So, um, you know, I think Nija and, and the rest of the peak coalition members have um, been fighting this fight for decades. And so um, there are many proponents for and against it. But I think, you know, as I've said, now more than ever, um, it's, it's the right time and uh, technically and economically viable to replace these pika plants as we're seeing all over America and all over the world. Yeah, thank you, Carlos. Yeah, and, and I would just add, you know, look, look at who's getting the bulk of the, the 4.5 billion in, in capacity payments, and um, that will give you a good idea of who wants to keep these online. And of course, as Carlos said, you know, the reliability concerns are the, the constant refrain from folks that are in charge of, of making sure that the lights are, are on and, and that the energy system is running as it should. Uh, utilities are not known for for great innovations and moving quickly uh, with new technologies. And so there's, there's a lot of pushback on, uh, on advancing the transition that, that needs to happen. So a, a question, and this might go back to, to you again, Carlos um, or, or Nell, um, just talking generally about some of New York City's decarbonization efforts and the effect that they will have on the use of peakers. Um, and some related questions, just talking about the synergy between some of the things that are coming online, like um, efforts to advance solar in, in New York and uh, offshore winds that is, is supposed to be coming online in the next few years. But how, how will that impact speakers and, and how is, is the Peaker Coalition um, incorporating those, those initiatives in, into our work? Yeah, I can um, start us off. So I think, you know, we are all very supportive of all of the renewable energy projects that are currently in development. Um, offshore wind in particular is something that we're very supportive of. Um, and there are a lot of solar projects, but there are a lot of barriers and challenges to get that distributed energy where it needs to be and get the energy storage in place. Um, so it has been a lot slower than we would like to see. And I think we need all of the projects that are currently already started, but we need so much more than that to get us to the place where we can begin to shut down these peaker plants. Yeah, and, and I'm happy to maybe take a more, a more granular look. So, um, you know, a couple of different efforts that Nija has been working on that would directly impact um, the necessity for these peakers to continue. Um, are you know a great example is Local Law 97, um, which passed in 2019 
um, is what many people consider the most ambitious climate legislation for buildings uh, enacted by any city in the world. Um, and so the new law places buildings that are 25,000 square feet and above to reduce their overall carbon emissions by 80% by 2050. Um, so, you know, what, what that essentially means is that, uh, you know, these very large buildings, which um, are very inefficient and just are a massive uh, demand on the energy load, um, are going to have to become more efficient and by doing that are going to decrease their energy load profile. When that happens, that of course moves the peak down. And as the peak moves lower and lower, our peak demand of um, the amount of energy that the city is consuming, these peakers are going to be less and less tapped. So by um, increasing energy efficiency all around New York City, um, we're going to be decreasing the reliance um, that the grid and these load pockets have on energy um, that, 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 would, that would call for peakers to be, to be called on. Um, and to be even more granular, like I said, you know, we're working with government authorities to be even more specific and intentional in the areas that we're working on energy efficiency um, and demand response. So um, not only just looking at New York City as a whole, but looking at the actual areas surrounding the peaker plants and trying to change the load profile of that neighborhood so that um, in the instances where there is transmission constraint and not enough energy uh, is able to be imported into that area, um, we are actually able to decrease the energy and shift the demand um, to a later time so that those peaker plants will actually never be called upon. So that's a more, more granular look. And as Seth and Anel said, um, you know, offshore wind is something that you know, we're all extremely excited for. I know um, Nija and Uprose uh, are in constant contact with Equinor, who is the solar development uh, one of the solar development um, companies that's in charge of uh, one of the offshore bids that uh, was placed, I believe, last year, um, which is going to be interconnected actually into the Sunset Park uh, interconnection port. So um, that's very exciting in terms of jobs and and uh, workforce training and um, just also the displacement of dirty energy with a more renewable, cleaner energy, which of course, has its own technical difficulties with reliability and um, with the rating, but um, all things that are are easily and, and capable of, of being solved uh, with intention and uh, the right people at the table. Great, thank you. Um, so, as a related question, getting into to talking about batteries, um, I'm going to to turn this over to the folks at Stratagen, um, Aaron and and uh, Elias. Um, can can current energy storage technologies make a significant contribution to displacing peaker plants uh, or do we need some other type of technologies that can work over a period of many days or, or, or weeks to meet that need hi seth this is this is aaron with strategy consulting thanks so much for that question um, I, you know, I think that what we're seeing today is that energy storage is already being relied on to help meet some peak needs. Um, I know one of the previous speakers specifically mentioned California, who's making a, a bunch of progress in, um, you know, bringing online some new energy storage that's, that's anticipated to help meet the state's energy needs. Um, and, and I think that model is, you know, very applicable for, for New York. I think the other thing that's so relevant is that we are seeing continued development of new energy storage technologies that have a broader set of capabilities to help achieve some of these clean energy goals. Great. Um, so a, a question, Aaron, for you uh, related to the, the um, capacity information. Uh, that was was in the report. Uh, can you, what was the source of the um, capacity revenue information that you used for that? Maybe you can go into some of the details about how that information was was compiled. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so NISA was really great in that they have a lot of transparency around, um, as Seth mentioned, the, the auctions that that they run in the. Um, capacity payments and the capacity prices that come out of those auctions. So, again, to Seth's point, those um, capacity prices were the basis for the analysis that that we did, um, and they're a really great way to help estimate um, some of these overall 
capacity transactions. As again, as Seth has noted, you know, some of these will be happening through bilateral contracts, but um, the wholesale transactions that are happening within NISO really help to create some visibility on um, how much it costs to keep these peakers online and running. And so we can use those to get a, a better sense of overall what, what the market looks like and how much um, customers are paying to support these resources. Is that is that a little bit of what you're looking for, Seth, or do you want me to go into more detail? No, I, I think that's good for now. And you know, if, if folks want more details on that, um, you know, I encourage them to go, go look at the report, which is again available at uh, peakcoalition.org. Um, that has, has more, more details in there. Uh, an interesting question came in that, that uh, about um, just asking if there have been proposals that have been seen about things like reciprocating engines or other peaker technologies that initially run on natural gas, but then have a plan to transition to net zero carbon fuels, um, things like synthetic methane or, or, or using green hydrogen. Um, if those have come up in the context of the, the New York City proposals. I know I, I remember seeing one of these for, for Los Angeles. Um, and you know, if they do, you know, what, what is the response of, of New York City groups to those kinds of proposals? Um, you know, again, this might be for Nija folks or um, Summer, Dariella, if you have thoughts that you'd like to chime in on this. Yeah, this is Anel, I can, I can take this one. Um, so I don't think we've seen any concrete proposals to transition peakers in that way, but um, we are generally very concerned with the use of biofuels. Um, we don't think that it accurately captures the um, life cycle emissions of it, and we think it's sort of just a way to continue the use of, of pipelines and um, combustion in our communities. So that is not really an optimal choice for us. What we wanna see is, is more renewables and storage um, to displace the peaker plants. Great. Um, a question came in talking about jobs. Um, how many jobs do peaker plants support and, and are they, they local jobs? You know, I, I don't think we have exact numbers on, on how many Folks are currently employed by the peaker plants in New York City, but we have done some research into this. I can say that um, you know some information that came out from another utility, uh, they quoted having 17 employees to operate 84 peaking units, which is is quite a lot. Um, that's a pretty big power plant, you know, on the order of, of hundreds of megawatts. So it does not take a lot of people to keep these power plants uh, running, and, and they also don't operate very often. So um, they're not uh, a consistent source of, of, of jobs for when they're, when they're operating. So um, it's much more likely that uh, alternatives, uh, renewable alternatives, battery alternatives, um, would be sufficient to job replacement, you know, as far as the number of jobs, local jobs. I don't know if others have, have any input on that, but I know those are some of the numbers that, that, that we've seen in our research, that speaker plants are, are not big job creators at all. Yes, yeah, Seth, can I add to that? And this is Summer. Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, just going off of what you said that, you know, peakers don't don't really offer that many jobs and keep to keep them running. But the alternative, um, you know, jobs in renewable energy, energy efficiency, um, construction, these jobs that are estimated to be created with the transition into a clean energy economy is um, will way surpass that. Um, the plant, New York's um, community leadership and climate, uh, huh, sorry, messing up, the CLCPA um, estimates to create 150,000 um, new jobs. And those jobs are specifically in those um, sectors to support the transition into clean energy and more energy efficiency. And so with those, with that S estimation for job creation, it's very important for the local implementation to support hosting those jobs, to, to support the, the sector transition into creating those jobs and creating job training opportunities um, you know, at scale, such as the Sunset Park Solar job training um, opportunity to train local residents um, and community members to be 
to have the opportunity um, to work in these spaces and to grow in their careers. Um, and so it's not about displacing jobs at all. It's really about transitioning into jobs and really creating more wealth and more equitable wealth in regards to the energy system and the future of that system. Great, thank you for that. Uh, a question uh, asking about when, when speakers are called upon, uh, for instance, say the, the Gowanus plant, uh, which has a capacity of, of 640 megawatts. Um, is it called upon for, for its full capacity or is it often operating at, at a lower capacity than that? Um, is is strategy folks want to chime in on this one? Okay, we may have lost um, lost someone from Stratagem I, I there. Can take this one uh, that. Yeah, sure. Go for it, Colors. Sure. So it, it really depends, and, and you know, I think an, an important um, notion to, to kind of understand, right? Capacity factor. It, it discusses how much of the full potential of the power plant, if it were running every sing at its full capacity, how much of the year is it actually running? So if it has a one percent capacity factor. That means that of all the energy that it could create, only it's only creating 1% of its full potential. So um, in terms of whether it go, runs at its full potential or not, almost every single generation type, whether that be a battery or a turbine or, or what, never runs at 100% because um, that just wouldn't be right for the equipment and for the grid. So they usually have a derating of, let's say, depends around 80, maybe 90%. But even then, um, utilities, depending on the load profile of that day, the demand may ask for uh, the peaker to run at 10% or 5% or 50%. It really depends. And that fluctuation uh, in energy can change from minute to minute, five minutes, 10 minutes, depending on um, what the utility or the NISO is calling upon that peaker to provide. Yeah, I think another important thing too is to note that um, the, those with larger capacities, um, those are often made up of, of a number of, of turbines. So there, there may be, you know, dozens of turbines um, for, for a larger facility. And those often don't all fire up at the same time. I think it's more rare than not that, that all of the, the turbines are, are called upon to, to operate at, at the same time. Um, there's a question about uh, battery storage projects in New York City. Um, ones that that are in the pipeline. Um, I know that that both Con Edison and and New York Power Authority are both exploring storage, and I think have some in the pipeline. Although I don't think in New York City itself. Um, the one major project that is in the queue and and has um, gotten some approvals is actually at one of the Peaker power plants, uh, the Ravenswood plant. There has been a battery storage project of. Uh, more than 300 megawatts that has been approved for the Guanas plant, or sorry, for the Ravenswood plant. Um, and they're, they're actually um, going to site that battery storage uh, where some old peaker plants, uh, peaker turbines used to be, and will be tearing those down. So um, that's a, a great step, and, and that's what we want to see more of um, as we do this work through the, the peak coalition. Um, a, a general question. Um, just about, I think this is about the, the, the CLCPA, uh, maybe now this is for you. It's, it's, it, what demands are the environmental justice, justice community going to make of the Climate Action Council to ensure that 35% uh, of the benefits of, of clean energy investments go to uh, low income and, and disadvantaged communities? Yeah, so um, in addition to the Climate Action Council that uh, Rachel described, um, where we have a few um, coalition allies, our New York Renews Coalition in there. There's also a climate justice working group, which has yet to be established. But as part of that process and, and that um, accountability mechanism, we will be developing both the screen to identify these quote unquote disadvantaged communities, as well as be able to monitor the funding that is going out from the relevant agencies like NYSERDA, DEC, DOT, um, to make sure that they're getting to the communities that need it most, not just in terms of sheer funding, but making sure that the programs are accessible, 
um, that the programs are resulting in clear benefits for the communities. So as part of that working group, we will be able to hold the state accountable to the CLCPA goals. Can I also add, hi, this is Dariela again. Um, I'll also add that I think that this is the time also when we look at the implementation now and, and how we hold um, our government elected and others accountable. It's also the opportunity for us, like the organizations that are on here that have histor um, history of community organizing to have people on the ground be very um, aware of what's going on and uh, knowledgeable about what's going on and creating their own solutions so that they're actively not only organizing, but they're act um, actively engaged in the processes that um, open up for where community can comment and community can, you know, um, let their, their electeds know that they're very aware of opportunities to do better and that, um, implementation of the CLCPA is something that we're not um, going to sit around and wait for and that is something that needs to be done. So uh, I think that that's also an important part of like um, some of the of our organization's um, work. Great, thank you. Uh, a couple of questions came in uh, about the siting of both renewables and energy storage. Um, Someone specifically mentioned the, the difficulty of, of, of siting energy storage indoors in New York City. Um, that That is true, that there are obstacles, uh, particularly for, for lithium-ion-based batteries, which are predominant storage technologies, battery storage technologies right now. Um, the fire department, New York Fire Department, currently does not have guidelines for siting energy storage indoors in New York City due to fire and safety concerns. There are guidelines for outdoor siting of, of storage installations um, but the indoor that's still the indoor process is still um, something that that they're working on so there is difficulties there although you know we see um, in addition to some of the projects that have been talked about such as the the hunts point you know siting at schools where, where they do have the ability to site it there um, distribute solutions for, for storage there also is a lot of land availability at existing power plants that um, if they weren't there, you could put plenty of storage there as has been shown by the Ravenswood project. Um, certainly, uh, solar resources, the space for solar is somewhat limited, of course, in New York City. Uh, Renewables Riker example is, is an example where you could put a large amount of solar in one place, um, but offshore wind represents a, a huge opportunity. As, as Carlos mentioned, um, you know, a big chunk of that is, is already planning to to go right into some of the load pockets where we're seeing um, some of the major peakers. So there is a lot of opportunity to, to site things um, in and around New York City, uh, even if there are, are some obstacles. Um, and I don't know, Carlos, if, if you have anything to add just on some of the processes that are, are taking place that are, are trying to clear the way, both um, as far as, as siting and as far as some of the, the regulatory hurdles to to get any more renewables um, in New York City. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, so, so you know, as we said, you know, peak coalition members are, are constantly trying to really understand the energy grid system that um, we're working in now and, and understand the economic um, implications of some of those market designs on renewables and energy storage and some of the new proposals. Um, you know, a great example of that um, is the hybrid storage interconnection proposal at the NISO and about how um, uh, renewables and energy storage paired together might be classified and compensated. Um, and that, of course, has to then be um, proposed to and voted on uh, NISO and then um, submitted to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission on a national level and a federal level, um, accepted and then there's kind of a back and forth. So um, just like uh, any kind of market design or economic proposal that has a lot of work and consideration and implication, um, and it's all extremely complicated and it's something that um, we're all very excited to learn more about and to really be more uh, intricate and intentional um, in our decisions and planning and analysis. Um, but things that, you know, P coalition members are I'm fully aware of and, and very excited to kind of tackle and um, to kind of hopefully set and, and pave the way to make 
renewable energy and energy storage extremely um, easy uh, to site and to fund and to uh, develop in New York City. Great, and I just wanted to add, I think um, at the local level here in New York City, um, city government has uh, effort to site solar and storage on public buildings across the city. And we're hoping that that will help facilitate the process and show you know, the best practices and best strategies to implement projects. And two public schools in the South Bronx that Dariella mentioned earlier are one of the first um, to be on the pipeline to receive that which we're really excited about that and we're hoping that that sets a precedent for how New York City can continue to expand renewables on public properties um, and we've also heard that they have even some projects on FDNY firehouses so that uh, they themselves can experience um, the, the project and see how it works so there is a lot of good movement um, on that on the ground here in New York City. Great yeah and, it's, and someone also commented on um, just virtual power plants for, for folks who aren't familiar with that. That's basically aggregating a, a number of distributed resources. So things like rooftop solar and batteries sited at, at individual buildings or businesses or homes that can be aggregated together to all act as one big unit. So you can take a lot of small units and, and if you have enough of them, you can have enough capacity to, to make them operate as a, as a power plant. That's why it's a virtual power plant. So. You know, we, we certainly see that as a huge part of the solution to replacing peakers, um, not just uh, the development of, of large scale renewables and then battery storage, but also a lot of distributed systems throughout uh, the communities that have been, particularly communities that have been impacted by these peakers for, for decades. Um, so uh, a question that I'd like to turn over to, to Erin, I think um, she's back with us now. Uh, it's talking about the price of batteries as, as alternatives to peaker plants. Um, you know, it just says that, that we correctly point out the high cost of, of peaker plants, but it argues that um, the cost of storage hasn't come down enough to uh, compete with these costs competitively. So saying that resource adequacy prices and capacity prices of energy storage contracts around the country are, are still higher than the capacity prices of of peakers. Um, they're arguing that uh, on a cost and dispatch basis that peakers may still be the favorable option. So um, if you could address that. Thanks, Seth. I, I think that's, uh, you know, can be a common misconception for clean energy. And I know Carlos talked about this quite a bit today in terms of the rapidly declining costs of many of these clean energy solutions. Um, I think that the, the costs that some of these buyers face or that, that they're seeing show up um, when they go out and ask for energy storage really depends on the structures that we're seeing um, in terms of how energy storage is interconnected into the market and how it's expected to, to participate in the market and be a part of the portfolio. Um, I think it's a, a mischaracterization to say that energy storage is more expensive um, than some of these fossil fuel resources. It's, it, it really, there's a lot of opportunities where energy storage can be deployed cost effectively. And I think this can be one of them. Yeah, and, and there are many examples across the country where there have been competitive bidding uh, processes where, where energy storage or energy storage paired with, with solar particularly have come in with, with lower bid prices um, for providing capacity, um, not just in, in California, a lot of people focus on, on California, there is a lot of movement there, but in a lot of other parts of the country as well. Um, we're seeing this in the Midwest and in the Southwest and, and in, in places in the Northeast east as well. So this is coming up. Uh, we are now about out of time. Uh, I really thank everyone for joining us. I know we didn't get to everyone's questions, so please do reach out to us um, with more questions or if you'd like to follow up with us, um, we'd all be happy to talk to you again at uh, peakcoalition.org is the best place to reach us. Uh, this webinar has been recorded and we will be sharing the webinar recording and the slides with everyone. Um, with that, I'm going to thank you all for joining. Thank everyone for presenting and then turn it back over to Sam. Sam, did you have any final thoughts before we close this off? 
Thanks, Seth. Um, well, we have a number of webinars coming up through Clean Energy Group. Um, you can visit cleanegroup.org backslash webinars for information on those. And that's it from me. Okay. Thank you, everyone. I, I think that's, that's it for today. And um, really appreciate you all uh, sticking with us through this. It's, it's a complex topic, and there's a lot to cover. So as I said, please do follow up. Take care.